Let us uh, uh, start uh, our uh, global seminar um, uh, in uh, our series Frontiers in Interdisciplinary Mechanics. And uh, today's our speaker is uh, Professor uh, Stefan uh, Bordas. Uh, Professor Stefan Bordas is uh, uh, currently Chair of uh, Computational Mechanics uh, at the University of Luxembourg. Uh, but before he was a PhD student uh, at Northwestern University, where he got his, uh, he was awarded by a PhD degree. Then uh, he, uh, for a very short time, uh, worked in uh, uh, Scotland, in Glasgow, and then he moved to uh, Cardiff University as a professor and head of uh, computational mechanics group. And uh, uh, after, uh, and he was also director of a Institute of Mechanics uh, at Cardiff uh, School of Engineering. And uh, now uh, he uh, uh, is leader of a huge group uh, of computational mechanics at the University of Luxembourg. Uh, they have very uh, good progress uh, in theoretical and applied uh, methods related to finite element methods and uh, in uh, application to many, many uh, real uh, life uh, problems. And uh, uh, so uh, last year uh, he was elected as a fellow of Learning Society of uh, Wales. Um, uh, due to his activities in uh, Cardiff. And um, uh, now uh, I should mention also that he's editor-in-chief of very uh, successful, and sometimes it is uh, the leading in Q1, the first uh, line in Q1, journals in mechanics. It is advances in applied mechanics. So uh, today he will speak about role of mechanics in a cancer, and uh, he will demonstrate of uh, potential of uh, poor elasticity, poor mechanics in the applications to very uh, this very complicated and very important uh, problem. So uh, please, uh, Stefan, uh, it is your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Borodic, or Feder, I should say, because we've known each other for 20 years. You just uh, reminded me. Thank you for the invitation to speak on the online global seminar series. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And today is the first time that I give a talk related to the role of mechanics in cancer. And uh, I did this because I thought that uh, mechanics is an interdisciplinary field. And being the, the editor of Advances in Applied Mechanics, I, I can see many researchers moving in the direction of biology. And I think it is a very exciting moment now that mathematics and computer science and computational methods have reached a point of matri maturity which allows us to really tackle problems that we uh, were not able to tackle before. So the work I'm showing today is a teamwork with many, many people. Uh, in particular, our PhD student, Mariam, uh, our postdoc, Stéphane Urquin, who was our PhD student before, our PhD student, Thomas Lavigne. Uh, also, um, we will base uh, our work and discussions on pioneering, pioneering work in pore elasticity for biomechanics by Giuseppe Choumet in Bordeaux, and Pierre-Yves Rohan in Paris, Wafaskali in Paris, and Pierre Nassois in Bordeaux, um, who is a biologist. And this is related to our collaborators in uh, Texas, the uh, computational uh, mechanics of cancer, where Lorenzo Gomez is working, and we published a joint review together on the role of mechanics on cancer in advances in applied mechanics very recently. Uh, as well as our collaborators at uh, the University of Luxembourg and at the hospital, uh, Andreas Husch and Frank Hertel, who is a neurosurgeon. Uh, on top of that, we're working with another neurosurgeon, Vincent Lubrano in France, and Davide Baroli, who is now in Italy. So this is basically the foundation of the team that worked on, uh, on the 
the slides that I'm presenting and I'd like to thank all of them for their support. So now, uh, this is part of my team in Luxembourg. So you, you can see Luxembourg is a very international place. It uh, contains a lot of nationalities. It's very easy to get used to the place. It's very easy to get integrated. People speak many languages, four languages by default. And uh, you can really see people from all nationalities uh, that you can dream of. And the place in Belleval is very dynamic. And we have many exchange programs and ways to attract here talent. And so if you're interested in this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, you will see on the slide some QR codes like the one at the bottom left. So if you take uh, the link which is there, you will be uh, driven to our um, YouTube channel and our websites, which will allow you to have more details about the talks that we gave in the recent past, in particular in machine learning, so that you can see a bit um, what we are doing. So if I uh, go back uh, 20 years, basically when we met uh, with uh, Feather at University uh, at Northwestern University, um, I was a PhD student and he was working with Leon Kier on uh, tribology. And so I started working in fracture mechanics and everything at that time was based roughly on phenomenological models. So if you know Paris law, models that are based on a lot of observations of a lot of phenomena which lead to understanding of how the phenomena actually work. So that was the beginning of uh, our work. Um, then uh, I moved to EPFL where I started working on landslides, which was a qu quite a different problem. But still we were using phenomenological models. I then worked with uh, Timon Rabchuk, who is now in Weimar on multi-scale and non-linear fracture, but again, everything was phenomenological. So with time, uh, we started working on models which were based on data. This is what we are interested in now. So for example, uh, data-driven methods, as you see at the top for breast cancer, which is not what I'm talking about today. I chose a different topic, but uh, I could give um, a presentation on that as another occasion where essentially the goal is to help the surgeon with real life data navigate in order to be able to get rid of the tumor that uh, the surgeon is targeting. So this is what uh, we, have, we have been working on now. We have been working on how to enrich phenomenological models with real time data that you acquire on the fly. So this is our basic focus in my team. And what I'm talking to you about today is um, slightly different from the point of view that we will go back to phenomenological models, but also try as much as we can to rely on data that we acquire on patients. So the work done is founded on the PhD thesis of Stéphane Urquin, whom you see here, supervised by the other people you see on this picture, in particular, Giuseppe Choumet, uh, Pierre-Yves Rouen, and Wafa Scali. So let's start by thinking about what a tumor is. So what is a cancerous tumor? So there are three phases in the growth of a cancerous tumor. The first is known as avascular. So vascular means blood vessels and A means without. So that means without blood vessels. So it means that oxygen is only diffusing to the tumor through only diffusion. So there is no advection no um, no other, let's say, active delivery of oxygen. Everything is passively diffusing through the tumor. And the tumor is growing at a certain rate until a transformation happens. And this transformation is known as the vascularization of the tumor. And that happens because if the tumor remains avascular, you can see at the center here, a circle of a different color. And this is known as the necrotic core, which means that this is an area where the tumor is be undergoing necrosis, which means dying. So as the tumor feels that it is dying, it's going to send some molecules in the surrounding tissue in order to promote the generation of vascular structures like those vessels that you see here. This is called angiogenesis which means generation of 
vascular structures. And as soon as that happens, you can see that these blood vessels will be able to uh, bring oxygen down to the necrotic core and progressively help the tumor grow faster, which is exactly its own goal. And over time, when the tumor is big enough and these blood vessels become thick enough, you can imagine that the cancerous cells that are located here inside the domain are going to start to be able to flow through the blood vessels and go back to the main blood vessel, which you can see here, and therefore create what are known as metastasis, which basically means the, that the cancer can move through the bloodstream and go and invade other areas of the body, which is exactly what you want to avoid. So the goal of the game is to try to catch tumors when they are still in their avascular, let's say, um, approach to colonizing the body, because at that time you can still easily, uh, more easily, let's say, get rid of them. Now, if uh, there are many ways that one can model uh, tissue in general, and we will talk about them a bit later, and one is known as poro mechanics, and it's not maybe the first thing you would do if you are asked to model uh, soft tissue. Um, however, this is what you uh, typically do when you model the ground, in particular uh, when you model uh, geomechanics. So, for example, uh, you will maybe be uh, familiar with the name of Darcy's law, which allows you to model the flow of fluid inside an aquifer or a porous medium in general. And uh, so the idea here is to take into account the different phases that are present inside the medium explicitly. And if you do that implicitly by homogenization, you end up with what is known as uh, Darcy's law. So as you can see here, there are three phases, a solid phase, a liquid, which is a water phase, including these menisci here and surface tension effects, and a gaseous phase, which is typically air uh, when you talk about geological media. Um, okay, so the first people to our knowledge to have worked on multi-phase flow power mechanics for soft tissues are Bernard Schreffler and Giuseppe Schumé. And uh, you can see that on the left hand side and refer to this paper in ECM Physical Biology in um, 2014, where the details are given. And the idea is to model the structure of the tumor or the tissue using four different phases. So you have a solid scaffold, which is the uh, matrix in which the tumors will grow. You have the tumor cells, you have the healthy cells that are not yet cancerous, and you have the liquid phase. And that is visible in typical images that you can acquire. So in effect, there are two ways that uh, people have been modeling uh, soft tissues. If you go back to uh, the original work of our colleagues in the literature. The first is what clinicians have done, which is to understand the behavior of tissues as a porous medium, so like a sponge that we have been describing until now. And the second is to think that everything behaves like rubber, basically like a tire, right? Exactly the same models as models of elastomers and so on. And uh, this is what we do in engineering. And uh, this is clearly another way of modeling, which we will compare to power mechanics a bit later. So now power mechanical modeling is not the easiest thing to do because it's quite expensive. You need to track many different phases and their concentrations, their velocity, their relative velocities. We will see that you uh, have to take into account material time derivatives as opposed to spatial derivatives. So things are a bit more tricky uh, conceptually and there is no unified theory. On the other hand, it's really able to take into account the coupling between the fluid phase and the solid phase, which is extremely important, as well as the transport of chemical species, which in the body you will intuitively guess is a very important point to take into account. So typically, if you look at brain tissue, for example, and you try to do a porochemical model of the brain 
uh, tissue. This is work by uh, Giuseppe Schume, uh, a slide that he uh, gave me a few years ago when I was giving a talk at MIT on this. And what you can actually see um, is that you have different types of tumors, different types of cells that are tumors and non-tumors, living and necrotic core, oxygen concentration, interstitial fluid, extracellular matrix, and so on. And that allows you to model the, essentially the mass balance inside the system. So how do you do that? You need to consider systems that are either closed or open. So in, in our case, we will consider things as follows. So if you have a closed system, the closed system has a fixed amount of mass of certain quantities that are of interest to you. And it has a boundary, which is known as uh, partial omega usually. And that boundary depends on time, but no mass can, can cross the boundary. Uh, then if you have an open system, as you can see, we have a dashed boundary now, and there are species that can cross and in both directions, which means that the system itself the control volume can gain mass or lose mass, for example. That means that mass and energy can cross, enter or leave the system. And this is what we are interested in here. And for a porous medium, this is a special case of an open system because you have a control volume that's occupied by the solid scaffold and the external surface um, is uh, possibly moving and is called the control surface. So that's basically what you need to know. And the solid is typically deformable, which means that the boundary will depend on time. So this is the way you can think of a sponge. If you take a sponge full of water and you compress the sponge, then the fluid will inevitably be expelled from the sponge. This is, uh, this is the way things work. And so how does it transform mathematically into equations? because we need to be able to introduce this into some mathematical model. And so this is what we're doing here. We first have to look at the types of derivatives that we are interested in. So for the solid phase, we are going to be interested in material time derivatives. And for the fluid phases, we are going to be interested in spatial time derivatives because those fluid phases are going to be referred to in terms of their motion to the solid phase. So in other words, if you look at the equations, you can see that the material time derivative of any quantity f with respect to time is the partial derivative at vectored by velocity v, so v dot grad f. And this v is due to the motion of, let's say, the skeleton, for example, because the skeleton, which is essentially the solid part of the sponge, is moving around. This is going to push the fluid, and this effect is going to be taken into account by the material time derivative and the advection term, which is V dot grad F. So this is essentially the conservation law for F. And um, now how does it work for the case that we are interested in, which is cancer? So we're going to have two uh, major phases. One is the solid and one is the liquid phase. And we are going to have also healthy cells and cancerous cells. So for, to start with, the volume fractions of solid and fluid are going to sum up to one. Essentially, we have the solid scaffold plus the healthy cells and the liquid phase. These two together should make one. So this is the so-called representative volume element. We don't mean it in the sense of what we mean by representative volume element in multi-scale methods, but it's quite similar in a statistical way. It is the smallest representative volume that's able to take into account the statistical variations in the samples that we take, right? So it's quite similar, but we're not going to do homogenization. We're going to take into account everything at a microscopic point in the continuum. So as we said, we have now two parts uh, to the variation. One is the intrinsic variation, which is the time derivative of the quantity f that we are interested in. And the second is the variation due to the deformation of the medium. In that case, if we are interested in the quantity related to the fluid, that will be the motion of the uh, skeleton, meaning of the solid scaffold. Okay, 
so then if we uh, write these equations, for example, for um, the accumulation of rate of the mass of, so of S, it will look like this. And we, we will have the accumulation rate, which is the material time derivative capital D capital DT. And we will have the flow outside, which is the rho S epsilon S dot grad Vs. And this thing should be, for example, zero if there is no interface mass transfer. But in some cases, there can be. Uh, the nice thing about this modeling framework is that if you have mass transfer or energy transfer across phases, you can take it into account directly simply by adding the required terms on the right hand side. And I think this is the um, really important point to take into account here. So for example, if you have transfer between, let's say, phase H and phase T, um, you have no transfer, but you have transfer from L to T or from T to L, then you'll be able to write the proper term on the right hand side, which is either zero or M or minus M, depending on what you're talking about. So this is known as the generalized Darcy equation, which was, as far as we know, um, introduced by Schreffler and Schumé in their work on cancer um, growth. Okay. So now, um, what can we do with such models? So our PhD student, Thomas Lavigne, has been working on muscles, um, and he has been doing consolidation tests. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, what you do is exactly what you would do for soil. In fact, you take a piece of muscle, you put it in a confined uh, compression test uh, machine, and uh, you let the fluid flow uh, happen naturally in a free way. In that case, this is porcine tissue. And what you look at is the variation of stresses with respect to time. So what you normally assume is that you will load in the cell and at some point you will have some relaxation, which some people model as uh, viscoelastic. Usually people call that hyper viscoelastic. Why hyper elastic? Because this is a way uh, to model uh, elasticity in large deformations when you have a strain energy density function that you phenomenologically write down in a mechanistic way and you have loads of models that are able to do this for example Ogden, Holzapfel and others have developed a very large variety of such models that allow to take into account more or less any phenomenon that you see at the microscopic scale. And because they are so general, they often are also related to large numbers of parameters. So as you can see here, the hyperviscoelastic case has 18 parameters associated with it, whereas the poor elastic model that I was describing earlier is able to capture more or less the same behavior, as you can see here, compared to the experimental average, which is this dashed line here in the middle of the of the blue experimental corridor, then you can see that with very few parameters, three times few, fewer parameters, the model is able to capture just as well, if not better, than the hyperviscoelastic uh, model. And this is a question that we are asking ourselves in my team quite a lot, which is if someone gives us some, let's say, experimental results, whatever that can be, images, videos of patients, or it could be anything related to stress and strain deformation laws or stress versus time, any data that is acquired either by us or by colleagues, how do we select the best model, the best mathematical model such that we can describe in different, different ranges of loading that behavior in the optimal way, optimal given the quantity of interest that we have fixed, which is a different story if you are interested in stresses or strains or displacements or average stresses or stress intensity factors if you have a crack or maybe contact forces if you're looking at tribology uh, in biomechanics which is a very exciting theme so essentially what we're trying to do is to optimize the model based on the data that we have and make it fit as well as possible that's one of the key themes in our legato team Another example of this is brain tissue. If you look at brain tissue, uh, which has been heavily investigated by many people, in particular by Sylvia Boudet, who is an, in Erlangen, 
um, along with Paul Steinmann. And what they have done is to work on mechanical properties of gray and white matter. And they published a paper which is known as um, um, the, the shades of brain tissue. Uh, so basically um, the, the different gray scales in which you can see uh, brain tissue modeling. So uh, 50 Shades of Brain is the title of the paper, and it's an excellent paper because it tells you all you need to know, at least according to the state of the art, about how to model the brain. And this is a very, very difficult topic. And you can also look at that using confined compression tests and try to figure out what model is the best. Uh, so what was done in that case, for example, is the first test was used for calibration. So you can see the force versus displacement on the loading and unloading. The second test was done for validation, so on a different, obviously, uh, sample, once the test, once the model had been validated. And, um, and you can see that basically the, the models fit uh, very nicely, even though uh, they were um, calibrated on, on different samples, obviously, in order to, be, uh, to do cross-validation. And uh, you can also check the paper by Stéphane Urquin, which I uh, wrote down here, uh, on um, the fact that uh, you can model brain tissue using, um, using a two-phase poroelastic model. So this is in uh, the Journal of the Mechanical Behavior of Biomedical Materials, um, which you can uh, see here, and it was published in 2022. Right, so now, what can we do about modeling cancer tissue? Until now we were talking about modeling healthy tissue, now we're going to talk about modeling cancer. So what is different? And what does mechanics have to do with cancer? So let's first do a bit of motivation so that you can see where we are coming from and how we got into uh, this topic. So first of all, uh, cancer is obviously subjected to the fundamental laws of physics. There is no escaping this. And uh, since the 1950s, age-adjusted cancer mortality rates have declined by only 11%. This is from the journal Oncology, um, uh, getting physical uh, in the journal Nature in 2012. So essentially what we are interested in here is the fact that cancer is a multi-scale disease. So multi-scale disease, what does that actually mean? Uh, we will try to explain this. So we can look at uh, the body in at different scales, like you can look at an uh, aerospace component, like a composite material, you can look at different scales. You can look at the, at the airplane scale, which would be the right hand side, the tissue scale. You can look at the meso scale, which is the aggregate of cell uh, size, which would correspond to, for example, a coupon in composite materials, or you can look at the cellular scale, which would correspond to a carbon fiber embedded in a matrix, or maybe a few carbon fibers. So in mechanics, in engineering mechanics, or in biomechanics, you can make these parallels and analogs. Uh, in biomechanics, what is particularly difficult is that several fields are coexisting in the same problem. So you have to deal with fluids, with chemicals that are diffusing and that they are advected and so on, as we discussed before. So things are uh, quite tricky. Uh, what you can see here is what happens to cells if you cultivate the cells. This is what you do in biology. So you have cell cultures in increasingly stiff environments. So on the left hand side, you are talking about 160 or 70 pascals. On the right hand side, a very stiff environment of almost one, well, let's say 1.2 kilopascals. Uh, what you can see then is that as the medium becomes stiffer, so what we mean by that is if you can cultivate cells on a hydrogel, which is very soft, or maybe on a quite rigid hydrogel, or maybe even on a very rigid surface. And as you cultivate the cells in increasingly stiff environments, what happens is that first, the cells are becoming more proliferative, so they divide more. Second, instead of being round and spherical and rather uh, nicely shaped, they start to take shapes that are closer to fractal shapes, like they have these little dendrites that start to grow. 
And on top of that, they start to secrete, let's say, chemicals, let's call, let's call them simply like that, which are known as integrin and catenin. And these are very specific to what happens in cancer. So you can see that in, in the paper that I referred to below here, where these images come from. And so basically what you see is that the stiffness of the environment has a huge effect on the characteristics of the cells, of how they look, how they grow, how fast, and what shapes they take. And um, you can see that on an, an example that you, you can see easily on this video, um, which is a capsule that is growing. Uh, so here you have some cancerous cells that are growing. So you can see the tumor is growing. And you can see on the outside, there is an envelope or some sort of membrane. And the goal of the experiment is to look at the deformation of the membrane and to deduce the forces applied by the cancerous tumors on the membrane by solving the inverse problem. So the idea is, you know the deformation of the membrane and you try to back calculate what forces are applied by the aggregate of cells. And that allows you to also measure the impact of the stiffness of this membrane on the ability of the cells to grow and also on their differentiation, as well as on their, um, their types, their shape and the number of times they divide. So you can refer to this uh, PNAS paper bef below here, uh, where the details are given. And a very good example of this is what happens with uh, men that have a benign prostate hyperplasia. And why do they have a better prostate cancer prognosis? So hyperplasia is a complex word that simply means too large. So if you have a prostate, if you're a man, you have a prostate gland, and this gland is too large. It's larger than normal. Uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, so this is the work of uh, our colleague uh, Guillermo Lorenzo uh, with uh, Tom Hughes and uh, others, uh, Hector Gomez and Alessandro Reali. It was also published in PNAS. And what they have uh, shown, uh, they have basically proposed a mechanical explanation for, for, for this fact. And um, the fact is that the prostate tissue is impervious. So when you have prostate hyperplasia, which means that the prostate is too large, that will, that will provoke a stiffening of the tissue because by default it cannot, it, it cannot let fluid go through, right? So it's, you're going to have a quite a large compression inside the, the tissue itself. And so if you have a cancerous tissue inside the prostate, the growing cancer will try to push, but it will not be able to push outward. It will be really constrained, very similarly to what was the case before in the aggregate case that I was showing. Um, so that means that at some point, this constraint will prevent the progression of cancer. And uh, however, if you do not realize that uh, you have this uh, prostate hyperplasia early enough, then it's possible that because of that uh, constraint that is posed by the tissue being very stiff and impervious, the cells that are inside the tissue, inside the prostate, can start to develop cancer cells because they are under compression and they are under high st states of stress. And we already explained that high stress stresses could lead to transformation of a benign tumor into a cancerous tumor. So that means that in that case, if you don't realize that there is hyperplasia uh, soon enough, then you could lead to, um, uh, th that can lead to, a, to an actual uh, issue. So this is a very nice paper uh, that you, uh, you can refer to if you are interested. Um, okay, so now what we want to do is effectively model these things. So now that we, we motivated uh, basically power mechanics, we motivated why forces are important and stresses <clears throat> and mechanics in general are important for cancer. We'd like to understand how we can sit down and write a model for this. So again, we talked about this many times and I'm not explaining all the, the equations one by one because the point is not really to understand all the details which you can do by reading the papers, but it's more to get 
the idea of behind the modeling. So you recognize the terms that we had before, uh, this uh, material time derivative with these uh, convected derivatives, uh, which, you, which you can see here. And you have exchanged terms. So you essentially, in the first equation, you have this term on the right-hand side, side ML towards T, and in the second one, ML uh, towards T with a plus sign, which means that you don't lose anything, you just write the, the balance for the two different species that you are interested in. And so this is called the generalized uh, Darcy term. Um, and that allows you to look at the influence and the interplay between the different phases, right? So by looking at the conservation of species, you can write the right-hand side, which is the important t t term in here, which allows you to, um, to look at uh, conservation of the species. So this is mass conservation of oxygen, and this is an advection uh, diffusion equation, as you uh, can see here. Um, so you have several terms. You have dependencies first in oxygen, so that means that if oxygen is missing, then, then the tumor will not grow. Second, you have a dependency on the pressure, um, and if the pressure of the tumor fa phase is too high, then the growth will also stop. Um, and then the question is, how is the oxygen going to um, actually behave? Um, so you have, as we just saw, the advective, um, the advective term, and you have the diffusion, the diffusion term, and then you have the absorption of oxygen by the tumor, which is that term. And now that we have these terms in place, we can try and understand how it actually happens in practice. So this is, um, for example, summarized in the Advances in Applied Mechanics paper that we published last year by with Stéphane Urquin, uh, Lorenzo, uh, Davide Baroli, Pierre-Yves Rohan, Giuseppe Schume, and uh, other authors. So you already saw this video. This is basically an aggregate. Um, this is a colon carcinoma, actually, enclosed into a capsule of alginate. So this is the alginate is what you see around the capsule I was telling you about. And it's used by experimentalists to measure the forces developed by cancer cells inside tissue. So this is what um, we talked about. So what Stéphane Urquin did in his thesis, and I'll give you all the references at the end, is that he uh, calibrated the model parameters against the deformation of one capsule. So what he did is he looked at the deformation of one capsule and then made use the porous medium model that we just wrote down and then calibrated the few parameters that he had. I cannot remember on the top of my head how many parameters there were, but it, it was only a few. And what was very nice about his work is that he also looked at the sensitivity analysis of these parameters so that he could get rid of extraneous parameters that were not influencing the, the results much. Um, so then he validated. And that what you, what you can see here is the radial displacement of the tumor. So this is, you see the tumor is growing. It has a radius. It's assumed to be approximately spherical. And uh, you're seeing that uh, versus time, and you are measuring that after confluence. Confluence means when the capsule is hit by the aggregate of cells. So you start measuring at that time because this is when the force uh, will start to be uh, measured. So you have the radial displacement versus the time uh, after confluence. And what you can see is that uh, experimental data and our model fits pretty well. And what is even more uh, interesting, because this is only uh, fitting one case, is that you can uh, play around with different capsules, either small and thick at the top left, um, or small and thin at the, at the bottom, the bottom two curves, and look at what happens. So, so that gives you essentially the ability of the capsule to resist the growth. And, um, and then you can see that with the same model parameters, without having to refit them, 
you are able to model the growth of the tumor and the forces that are applied on the boundary of the capsule very similarly to what is done in experiments. So this was a very, very exciting result for us because with one model but that was calibrated on one case, we were able to uh, mimic what happened in many other cases without having to fudge the, the parameters again. And this is for <laughs> tissue not easy at all to do. And I thought that the work of Stefan in that case was really, um, really admirable. OK, so that's what you see here, essentially exactly uh, the same thing, except that you're looking at the stresses versus uh, time, looking at the radial stresses and uh, different pressures. OK, so now we are done with this. And the last part is going to be an in vivo application to brain cancer. And that work is done in collaboration with different neurosurgeons, in particular Vincent Lubrano and uh, Frank Hertel. And also from time to time we discuss with Pierre Robb as well in Utrecht. Um, and the work is done by uh, Miriam, our PhD student founded by the Institute of Advanced uh, Studies. So these slides are associated with her work. So I'd like to thank her for uh, what she has done here. So gliomas are uh, basically brain tumors. And they were defined in 1865 as tumors in the central nervous system uh, whose neoplastic cells microscopically resemble non-tumor uh, glial cells. So in the brain, you have lots of cells that originally people thought had absolutely no point. Uh, they are called glial cells, so or microglial cells. So you have in, in the brain, everybody will agree that neurons are very important because they send the neural signal in the brain. So they allow you to think, feel emotions, and so on. So these neurons are very important, but around the neurons, there are lots of other cells which have huge numbers of uh, let's say, roles, but that people have neglected for a very long time. And in the last one to two de decades, biologists have figured out that these cells, known as microglial cells, and we could talk about them in a different talk as well, because we have uh, some students working on modeling these cells, in particular astrocytes. So these astrocytes, we will talk about them a bit later, are cells that help neurons metabolize energy. So they help them have sufficient energy to function. They uh, are also used in calcium signaling, which is key to sen sending the action potential along neurons. Uh, they are also doing garbage collection. They have a structural role in order to help holding the neurons mechanically in place. So there is another mechanical action here that's useful. And they have a vast variety of other roles not all of them may be even known to biologists. Um, so what happened is, is that since this uh, first discovery, let's say in 1865, or at, let's say the first discussion that, uh, that I just uh, quoted, the uh, World Health Organization, WHO, classified these brain tumors into uh, different uh, grades, let's say how invasive and how deadly they are. And uh, now we have not only a histopathologic way to look at the different uh, categorization, but also a molecular approach, which is called molecular diagnosis. Um, so there are lots and lots of um, classifications, of ways to classify, let's say there is there are different classifications, but there are different approaches to classify these tumors. I'm not going to uh, go into any of these uh, keywords and acronyms because this is a very large amount of work to even understand what they mean. And I'm not able to explain all this in, uh, in the time that we have together. But uh, what is important to think about here is what the goal of the work that we are doing is. And the goal of the project here is to try to predict where the mutations are going to happen. At some point, cells that are non-dangerous, let's say, benign, are going to transform into cells that are very hostile to the body. And the question is, when is that going to happen? And why is that important? Because if we, of course, 
can figure this out early enough, we can maybe prevent these astrocytomas from becoming too invasive and killing the patient. And this is very, very important because it turns out that these uh, glioblastomas are very deadly and very quickly. So if you figure out that the glioblastoma is there, it's almost guaranteed that the patient will die within the next year, maybe even six months. So the goal is to try to figure out which patients are more likely to get these transformations in order to get rid of the cell before this transformation happens. Because once that has happened, it's extremely difficult or even impossible to uh, get rid of them. Okay. Um, so what is uh, malignant transformation? There is quite a lot of, uh, of literature on this and I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to try to explain to you why uh, glio um, astrocytomas. So there are low-grade gliomas, which means that, um, yeah, low-grade means less dangerous and high-grade means more dangerous, essentially. So the as astrocytoma grade two and grade three. So why are we interested in this? So first reason is that the malignant transformation occurs before, um, before other types of, uh, let's say, brain tumors uh, such as oligodendroglioma. So oligodendroglioma is related to oligodendrocytes, which are other types of cells than the astrocytes that we just talked about. And so because it happens earlier, it's also more dangerous. So let's look at them for that reason. Second reason is because there may exist a mechanobiological phenomenon uh, that is specific to astrocytoma that we would like to look at. And if you want to know more about this, you can look at uh, Bertal et al. in 2018, and this is uh, discussed in detail there. All right, so now, um, what are we going to do in order to get the parameters of these models? Because it's all nice to have all these very nice power mechanical models, but the first question I would have if I were in the audience is how in the world are you going to get these parameters? Because yes, you maybe don't have as many as the models used to model rubber tires and you know the ogden holds up for models and the uh, hyperelastic models we talked about at the beginning. But still, you do have some parameters and it can be also argued that they are more difficult to get because how are you going to actually take a piece of, uh, of that um, material and measure, let's say, you know, the conductivity of the, of the medium or uh, the amount of holes that you have, the, the, solid, the volume fraction, the amount of fluid, the types of cells and so on. You need to be able to know these things from certain measurements. And the difficulty, of course, is that reaching uh, patient data is very difficult and you need quite a lot of understanding of the image modalities, let's call it that way. And this is what Miriam has become an expert in, thanks to her work with Andreas Husch and Frank Hertel at uh, the University Hospital that we have here in Luxembourg. Um, so during the clinical process, what we can do is different MRI. So MRI is known as magnetic resonance imaging. And you can actually get a lot of information and data that can be used to initialize, calibrate, and also evaluate the poor mechanical model that you will then um, use. Um, so typically what you do is this. So you will take different types of, um, um, of MRIs. So MRIs are relatively straightforward to take now, uh, but you have quite a different number of types of MRIs, which I'm not going to go into details. I'm just going to tell you what you need to know to understand how we get the data. So first of all, you have the first patient, you do a diagnosis and you say, for example, grade two astrocytoma, which means English classification by WHO. That means something specific that the, that the clinician can understand. You do another patient's checkup a bit later and you see still grade two astrocytoma. And then at some point you have malignant transformation, MT, and you see that the patient checkup is saying grade three astrocytoma, which means that things are becoming a lot more dangerous. 
Um, then in parallel, you run your Poro mechanical model. So first of all, you need to initialize this model. And in order to initialize this model, you need to use what you have, which are the MRI scans that I was talking about just before. So this is called initialization. Then when there is the second checkup, you can calibrate because you have yourself modeled the growth of the tumor, as you can see on the, on the MRI that I've reproduced here. And you can uh, compare the tumor volumes in both cases. And then the idea is to make some sort of prediction of the future malignant transformation and figure out which zones inside the tumor, which was grade two, are now grade three. Because not all the cells will be grade three, but some of them will have gone through malignant transformation. And the question is, which of those cells will, um, will be um, malignantly transformed? Let's put it that way. So that is the research question. Is malignant transformation of this LGA encouraged by high mechanical stresses? And we're going to try to help answer that question. So first of all, we have a, a model description of the brain uh, micro um, environment. Uh, this is how things look. So those are the neurons and you have the astrocytes that are making connections which you can see here so those those guys here are the astrocytes they take some information some o2 some glucose and so on from the bloodstream and give this to the neurons um, and you have the interstitial fluid all around as well as uh, let's say a fibrous network and then you have the tumor cells, which will uh, start to, um, to actually grow. Um, so from a macroscopic point of view, the brain is really made of different layers. And if you zoom, which you can actually see here, uh, you can see neurons, you can see the vascular system and the astrocytes that I was mentioning. And you can also, of course, find healthy cells and that the, um, you can see these uh, this ECM that serves as a solid scaffold, as I was saying. And um, all of that mixture is floating inside the interstitial fluid. So now what happens in the case of cancer? Uh, and you can see that in the literature that, that you can see on the right hand side. So in the case of cancer, you see that there is a compromised version of the ECM and cancer cells. So this is only a high level description. And of course, the brain can be modeled in very many other ways, like viscoelastic, hyperelastic, and poroelastic, and so on. And what we're interested in here is to look at the interactions in the microenvironment at a larger time scale. And so for that, uh, we will choose again a poroelastic framework. Okay, um, now let's, so poroelastic means, means sponge, as you can see, here. So now if we split the constituents that we have just uh, talked about, we can identify that we have a solid scaffold, which serves as the structural part of the system, so epsilon s on the left. We have a fluid phase, which is the right hand side, epsilon l, um, and it has a porosity which is divided into three phases. So the tumor, epsilon t, the healthy cells, epsilon h, which are the astrocytes that are still healthy, and the liquid phase, which everything flows in. And the solid phase now has its own subphase, the volume fraction of vasculature, which is also important because you need to know how much blood is being brought to the tumor, as we discussed at the beginning, to know whether we are vascularized or not vascularized. So now this is basically the porous medium that we have defined, that Miriam has defined with the help of Stéphane Urquin. And uh, we need to initialize the models with inputs from clinical and uh, experiments, experimental literature, as well as from the patient. So this is the next phase. So to do that, we are going to use patient data to calibrate the patient specific parameters and also to evaluate the model's results, obviously. So then the main point, the main output of the model is going to be a pressure map that's going to represent the intracranial pressure overlapped with the blood flow map taken from the patient MRI. So what we get at the end is what is the pressure exerted by 
the um, uh, by the tumor so what is the intra intracranial pressure and what is the blood flow map inside the patient MRI inside the patient and that gives us a prediction for the malignant region of the tumor so what we hypothesize is that an overlap between a high blood flow area meaning that the, the blood is coming a lot in this area heavy vascularization and high pressure can be an indication of malignant transformation this is a hypothesis which we then test um, okay so that's basically the way we run the pipeline i'm not going to uh, go through that slide because it's quite uh, redundant with what i just said at the end of the day we get the superposition of the pressure map and the blood volume fraction and what we are interested in is the intersection between the high pressure and the low uh, blood vascularization. Okay, and that gives us okay, an indication of where things are. I just wanted to show you this. Yes, and we will see that in action now on a particular case. So this is the pipeline uh, that we use. So we use only com open source software and uh, all the data is easily available so um, so i'm not going through that because this is uh, this is basically technical but not easy i'm not saying it's easy it's just simply maybe less interesting for a large audience and now let's try to figure out what uh, what a, what would do what would a surgeon actually do so the surgeon would have a malignant transformation definition so it's trying to look at uh, different MRIs which are known as pre and post contrast so the first time I heard this I was very confused because I thought of contrast in the sense of contrast of an image but of course what that means not of course but what that means is that you inject a contrast agent in inside the patient so that certain cells pop up a little bit more um, so this is known as a contrast agent so through the follow-up uh, to the patient, two types of MRIs are, are then taken, one with no contrast and the other one with contrast. And the, that allows us, oh, well, the, actually the surgeon, to see certain features that are not appearing in the M MRI without contrast. So the most aggressive region of the tumor can be seen when the contrast agent is used. So at malignant transformation, we have a new hypertense hyper intense region that you can see that is noticed and the clinician can then compare both MRIs to see uh, the different segments of uh, the malignantly transformed region and that is usually used by clinicians to define the most aggressive regions of a tumor so basically that is what the state of the art is um, now you have diffusion MRIs and in particular apparent diffusion coefficients that is what the MRI actually tells you it tells you the ability of the water molecules to diffuse in the brain so this is how the MRI works and you have also a hyper intensity which means that you have free diffusion of water molecules and therefore you think that there is a high liquid saturation and a minimal minimum cell saturation so when you see very high intensity in these post contrast areas you see that there is a free diffusion of water and therefore you think that there will be a maximum saturation of liquid therefore fewer cells and if you have a hypo intensity that shows restricted diffusion of water and therefore minimum liquid saturation and therefore maximum cellularity which means that the tumor is there very active because you have the sum of the healthy and tumorous cells so you actually know that there are lots of cells you don't know if there are more tumors than healthy but at least you know there are many cells because there is a low amount of flowing molecules of water um, now the question is because these MRIs are only qualitative they are not quantitative because there is a question of uh, normalization of the signal and there is not only believe it or not one way to analyze these MRIs uh, they have to be taken with a lot of uh, a lot of care and this is what Miriam has done and, um, and she was able to figure out a way to do this in a, in a very nice and conclusive approach. The second thing we're interested in, and this is uh, the last piece of the puzzle, is the blood volume fraction. So what we assume is that the more blood vessels are there, the more oxygen is available, hence the more nutrients are available to the tumor. That's what we said at the beginning. 
Um, so for this reason, we use vascular volume fraction in the calculation of the mass transfer between the interstitial fluid and the tumor. So that's what you see here. The mass transfer between the fluid and the tumor is uh, basically done as a function of the blood volume fraction, which you see here. Okay, so now what happens if we look at our uh, power mechanical results? Uh, well, what we can see is that one region that was obtained by T1 subtraction, so I cannot explain here what that means, but it's essentially an image analysis approach, um, is also predicted by the model. So you see the model results, the power mechanical results on the left, and on the right it's only based on imaging data, which is state of the art. And now if you are like me colorblind, these images are not easy to read, but um, you can see the region that, uh, that is identified by the model as malignant transformation. Malignant transforming are highlighted here. So this is these highlights that I'm making here in white. <coughs> and on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the aggressive uh, region is identified by the surgeon here, which is not that bad, uh, given that the fact that our model is actually able to predict more or less where the... Uh, what the surgeon would have predicted. And if you look at the subtraction map, which is the image only without model approach, you can see that there is quite a good overlap between the model prediction and what you see in the image itself. And these results are published in the book chapter, which uh, was recently published. So I'm giving you here a few references, so you can just point your phone or other device to those QR codes in order to download them directly which will save you some time. So I will leave that here a few seconds. Or you can take a print screen, or depending on what, how you are watching this video. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for your, um, your invitation here to speak at this global seminar series. I think that uh, what I would conclude about this uh, work is that uh, there is a huge potential for mechanics to have impact in biology. Not only, and when I say mechanics, I don't mean only studying forces and displacements and pressures and velocities, but also the coupling with chemical reactions, reaction advection diffusions, and so on, that uh, Sofia Farina in my group has been working on with um, Alexander Skupin. Professor Alexander Skupin at LCSB in Luxembourg on trying to understand Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and the role of astrocyte metabolism on uh, producing energy for neurons. So I would like to really thank you for your attention and pointing you also to two of our recent publications and I'm letting uh, you uh, imagine the future where maybe we will be cured by uh, machine learning algorithms or maybe even by robots and uh, I would like to thank the sponsors and also the founders of our work. And I look forward to uh, discussing with you if we have some time. I'm sorry I'm a bit long, but uh, I did not want to stop in the middle. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing more uh, from you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Borges, for uh, your very interesting uh, talk. So, uh, questions, please. Uh, well, uh, at the moment, uh, 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 everyone is a little bit shy. So, <clears throat> actually, uh, yeah, okay, uh, Jean Ming, uh, please, your question. Uh, you are mute. Yeah. Professor uh, and Borders and Professor Fiedo Bordich. Uh, so I'm Tom Mingu from Cardiff University. Um, so basically, um, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your your, your talk. Um, so I'm recently I'm used to be uh, working on the solid mechanics and the plate structure mechanics. But recently, I trans try to transfer my research to to the biomedical application as well. So what? So my question is a quite general one. So what I'm doing is uh, currently I I convert the 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 normal CT images to the high quality CT images by using the for for bones for bone structures by using the topology optimization method. So we can we can reconstruct the 
the micro uh, tubercular microstructures using this method. You combine the sort of mechanics and optimization method to convert this uh, CT image to high quality uh, uh, CT image. So is there anything, you know, I know you are working on the cancer and the cells, biological cells. Is there anything similar topic can follow the, the similar things we can using a, you know, the normal, like a normal images or other detection images, but combined with the sound mechanics method approach, which can help us to, to, to either diagnose this disease or, or, you know, or at least to can infer some, you know, infer some particular, particular information we can't directly read from those, uh, you know, normal biomedical images. Can, can you give me more information? Sorry, I, so my, no, 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 it's okay. It's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it makes me think a bit because so uh, what you're asking is if you have certain images and you want to enhance yes. these images with models, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm telling you. So first, what I'm doing at the moment from my, from my research group, I'm working on the, uh, I combine the you know the conventional FEM modeling, the solid mechanics modeling, yeah. and the topology optimization. I combine this method with we we working on the structure mechanics. I use this similar method to convert the CT images, the normal CT images of the bone, of the bone. Mm -hmm. to the high quality images, biometric images, so we can infer the, you know, the microstructure of the uh, tubercular, tubercular structures. So this is what I'm doing. Okay. So you're and transforming, the, sorry, you're transforming an image to another image? No, we are not, we are not transforming, we are predict. So after our prediction, we compare our predictions with the high quality, like, like the high quality CT images, because the high quality CT images is normally not that easy to do in, in, in hospitals. Oh, I think normally I hospital can only but do, it's is, more expensive and so, more time consuming so, and the high yeah. dose of the X-ray, okay. I think. Okay, so I basically so the what, CT. So can, can I try to rephrase because I'm trying to understand what you're saying? Yeah, so sorry. You, you're, you're doing, so you're doing a CT scan which is low yes. resolution, then you're making mm. some computations and you're creating a solution, which is what you would see if you did a higher resolution CT scan, but you don't need to do it because you have your model that predicts what yes. you would actually see. Yes, exactly. But, are, but, yes. Uh, but you're not modeling the, the imaging process, are you? Are you modeling no. the, no, you're not simulating We are modeling the, 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 the mechanics, biomechanics. Okay, yes, the, okay. The so, biomechanics of the bone. Okay, sorry to be so, so long. We, we using the, Sometimes like a physical inform, yeah, 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 yeah. physical see, inform model. Okay, so that, to, that to predict these yes. images. No, that that's very mm. uh, extremely useful. I mean, I, I think this is the the standard way to solve problems when you, for example, you have a high resolution MRI uh, of a tumor, yeah. and. Um, the problem is that during the operation, let's say it's a brain tumor, so you have to open the skull, right? And uh, yes. when you open the skull, the, everything moves inside the skull. So the, the tumor is going to move around. And so what you, what you need to do is to deform the preoperative image, which is a high resolution MRI, into an intraoperative image by applying boundary conditions on this image. This is known as non-rigid registration, which is basically an optimization problem. And so we did that in real time for breast, breast cancer, for example. I could present that to you if you like separately. So that yeah, yes, how it yeah, works. of course. Yeah, if you have time. And to, yeah, to... so I could give another talk another time. I don't know, but I also I also recorded <laughs> okay. it on the on the Legato team website. So uh, there is a video of the presentation that I gave. Yeah, have a look. Mm. Yeah, so uh, it's so on, on the first. So you, you, you uh, I probably missed a bit of your your talk. On the, so you you mentioned the. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Go ahead. Um, okay, so you so you mentioned you when we open the you know the, the tumors is as you said moving around the the you still need the the you know the the prediction or mechanics to to I'm not very yes. sure. So what I'm thinking yes. is uh, is there any possibility to apply the similar method to this your your 
your yes. your current research. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly. There, there, there are lots of possibilities. In fact, this is what people do. Uh, this is what people do in general. I mean, this is a very well known uh, problem. And in computer graphics, people have been doing this for uh, 20 years now. And um, and I wanted to show you how we do it. So that's basically the yeah. the example of of what we what we actually do. Because if you have a if you have a a tumor in the in the breast, typically the MRI is taken face down. But the problem is that during the surgery, uh, the surgery is done face up. So you can imagine that the gravity is going to deform the breast. And of course, uh, you have a tumor localization in the face down position, which will be completely different from the tumor localization in the face up position. So you need to somehow solve that problem. And the way we do it is we remove gravity. So we take the patient to the space station virtually. So where there is no gravity and then we reapply gravity in the other direction. This is work by Arnaud Mazier. Uh, if you want, you can take a look at this paper. There is the QR code here. Yeah, I'll have a look at this, um, this work. And, uh, so this is a similar way you're doing. So you're using the, the pre-operative image yes. to infer the, the other side of the image. Exactly. But this combined with the, this is a basic, also basic, the, the, the mechanics, mechanic, the, 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 you know, the Absolutely. Yes. mechanics model, right? Yes. That's okay. right. And the difficulty, okay. I'll, I'll have a, I'm so glad, this will be very similar to what I'm doing. Here. Very good. So we can talk about it. Uh, what, what I think is, is very important and difficult here is the inference of the material parameters of the model in real time. Because you see, the mm. problem is you'd have no model of the breast of that patient because you never saw that patient before. I mean, you saw her, him or her because it can be him, actually, um, on yes. uh, you know, two or three cases, but you don't have a general model of this tissue. You don't have the parameters. The parameters will change depending on the menstruation cycles or during even the month, the, the behavior will change. So you, you cannot know in advance. So the only thing you can do is look at what you see. And in, in that case, what we use is, is um, some uh, LIDAR scanning that you can have on your phone, you know, based on lasers, you can see the mm -hmm. 3D shape. And based on that, you can reconstruct what are the material properties and then use that to inform the surgeon in, in, in really in real time. It takes less than one second, a few hundred milliseconds. So and okay. that is really what the advance, I think, of that work was. But there is a huge amount oh, of work. Yes, this will be the, so you said you, we take a normal photo from the from the image as a breast and then it, we're using the, okay. the mechanics model to in predict the inside of the material behavior That's this it. will be yeah this it, will be a good idea exactly. okay yeah okay thank you for okay thank you very much very uh, nice question. Uh, uh, hopefully i can have opportunity to discuss you further later yeah, yeah. please send me, to other people. send me a whatever email or whatsapp or yeah whatever. i will i will email you later thank you thank you thank you Okay, we have a question from the audience. He asked uh, how to model the growth of a tumor. Ah, um, so how to model the growth of the tumor? Any recommended references? Yes, well, uh, that's what we were talking about here. So uh, let me go back to the, uh, how do I exit this? Okay. I will, so any references? Well, I think the, all the ones that I gave during the talk are good. Um, if you are interested in some, let us call this um, review, you can take a look at those uh, because in particular, uh, digital twinning of cellular capsule technology, uh, this is a review. Uh, you can also look at oncology and mechanics landmark studies. This is also a review, so that should give you a, a lot of references. And the other thing, uh, in fact, I could even paste that in the chat. I don't know if it will work, but um, maybe it will. Uh, maybe it won't. Okay, I think it won't. Uh, but you could, uh, yeah, you can take a look at, uh, at at those. And I think, I mean, there are different ways you can think about it because there is a lot of work in the mathematics community where people uh, look at uh, how to to model 
tumors, but what they normally do is that they have, uh, you know, models which are normalized. They look at very, you know, simple spheres, or they look at uh, a unit square or something similar. So uh, there will be different ways to think about it, but I, I think at the moment, what, what is the most advanced models are these models that I talked about today, so the poor mechanical models. They, in my opinion, I mean, it's only my opinion, uh, this is what you, what you can rely on, and um, and hopefully that uh, that will work. Yeah. So I put the image there. Normally, you should be able to open it and and click on the links related to the QR codes. Hopefully, you're welcome. And don't okay. hesitate to reach out to me if you if you need more. Yeah. Okay, uh, 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 Ryan is satisfied with your uh, answer. Uh, I have, uh, I believe, uh, it is the last question uh, uh, because we are out of the uh, time uh, schedule. Um, you really uh, convinced me that your uh, poreelastic uh, model is uh, uh, better than a uh, hyper. Uh, elasticity um, viscoelastic model. Uh, indeed, uh, even from uh, an isotropic uh, elasticity, we know that uh, there's 21 independent constants in general case of uh, elasticity, but uh, it is very difficult to obtain uh, their, uh, uh, this uh, parameters uh, experimentally. Uh, even nine uh, parameters of uh, uh, model, uh, it is uh, not so simple. So normally it is only uh, five uh, parameters of uh, transversal isotropy uh, is uh, possible to, uh, uh, they are quite reliable uh, methods to obtain them experimentally. In your case, you are from 18 parameters that uh, I don't know how they uh, calculated them uh, and uh, how they compare them with experiments. You got model with six parameters. So this is, uh, looks uh, much better. But uh, my question is, uh, do you uh, uh, have a reliable uh, experimental procedure to uh, calculate uh, all these six parameters of your model? Yeah, so that is a really difficult question. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for asking. Uh, so depending depending on the case, we will we will have different uh, ways to answer that. So as you saw in the last part of the talk, we could identify some of the parameters using the MRIs directly. So that's uh, that's one way. Um, then what we can do is measure uh, different properties using different medical imaging procedures. The big difficulty that we have is that we indeed do not have access directly to the tissue uh, because we simply cannot open the person and look at it uh, from inside you know? so we cannot there are many things we have to infer based on the available let's say ultrasound or mri or ct scans or micro cts or pet scans or whatever we have at our disposal so i think in fact one of the difficulties in general in the field is to try to work with these uh, people that are coming up with the images to because there is no simple answer i cannot say you know parameter one we do like this two we do like that three we do like that. so i have no general answer uh, for that <coughs> but what i can say is that in our case what we did is we calibrated this on um, on a very confined case of an experiment that we did in the lab we didn't do but some colleagues did uh, pierre nassois and we validated on this then we use those parameters and we expected that they would be similar in the real in vivo case. So we calibrated in vitro and we assumed was a bit similar in vivo. That's of um. course a big assumption uh, and it's generally not true. So 
in, in general, I think the, the direction for research that's super exciting is basically to work with the people that are coming up with the uh, MRI scanners themselves, you know, like uh, Siemens and so on, because what you see is an image, but in fact you have a signal that comes out of the, of the machine. So if you could directly get the signal, I think you would have a lot more data to use and to work with than you actually have coming up only with the image, which is a bunch of black and white and gray scale. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be much more rich. And if we could do that, I think that's that's a way that we could identify material properties in a in a more rigorous way, uh, because yeah. what is sure is that doing it a, pr a priori is very difficult and probably wrong. What we need to do is to do it mm -hmm. in vivo on site at the moment when the image is taken because this is the only thing that's true mm -hmm. anything else is wrong so uh, that makes it very challenging i think you actually pinpointed the most difficult as usual uh, problem uh, in this field okay thank you very much thank you actually uh, 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 uh so uh, uh, sorry we are out the uh, time uh, schedule uh, but uh, what i want to say is that uh, uh, this w the talk was very interesting so uh, uh, i would like to uh, uh, thank uh, professor uh, stefan borders for his very exciting and very interesting talk it is really uh, very very important for all humans because you know uh, 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 cancer is this one of the uh, main reasons for death of people and so it is very very important for uh, real life uh, um, of, uh, humans uh, well actually this is the last seminar of our g seminar uh, series uh, so uh, i uh, should ask uh, 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 actually, sorry, I reformulate my uh, last phrase. Uh, I would like to thank uh, 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 all uh, speakers of this seminar. Uh, it is for many countries, uh, very high level uh, speakers of all our seminars. And so um, it is really uh, was a, a, a very hard work for them uh, to prepare all these seminars that are available for a general audience uh, in China and uh, actually uh, for, uh, in other countries because it will be everything online. And uh, so uh, it was a great idea of Professor Xiao Qin Jin, uh, uh, who uh, discussed this with me, and we decided to organize this uh, series. And so uh, uh, I believe that it was uh, quite successful. And so uh, I'm uh, very happy uh, that we uh, uh, were able to attract attention of many people to uh, seminars of very high level uh, uh, speakers. So thank you again, uh, everyone. Uh, and uh, so, uh, who knows, maybe we will organize another a series of such kind. Uh, uh, we don't know who knows this in the future. So, thank you, uh, Stefan, again. And so, it is the end of our uh, seminar and our seminar series. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Fedor. Bye.